Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musicians. I'm Kenny Holmes. That's Matt Schrader. Hey. What's up, Matt? This is Score, the podcast. Really excited about our episode today. I got a chance to go to the world premiere of this movie, The Iron Claw. This is right down your alley. This is, Oh, uh, yeah. Wrestling movie. A <laughs> uh, lot of... lot. I mean, it's it's intense. Um, the, the wrestling is spot on. They, they were trained by wrestlers. It's really good. And the score is terrific. And our guest today is the composer of that film, Richard Reed Perry. He's a band member of the Arcade Fire. And he also scored a movie called Eileen, which is out as well. So he's on a tear right now. And we're excited to talk to him before he gets... Too big, even though he's already like a global rock star. Um, but I know Robert was world, super bummed that uh, yeah. he couldn't be part of that chat. So Yeah, Robert's on holiday, probably watching the Iron Claw in theaters right Obviously. now, most likely. Um, but we're going to get to <laughs> that chat with Richard Reed Perry in just a second. He's going to join us from the East Coast. Um, but before we do that, Matt, uh, we're coming up on the Golden Globes. This this award season's kind of crazy because everything got pushed with the strikes and everything. So it's almost reminiscent of like 2020. Like everything's just kind of bottled up on top of each other. We got yeah, another Globes, weird year. Emmys, Grammys, Oscars all within like six or seven weeks of each other. Um, so it's going to be a little bit crazy. Um, but uh, let's get into it. We have one, two, three, four, five. Five, six nominees for Best Original Score in the Golden Globe category. And this is, again, we're we're into, like, award season again, where half of these people haven't even seen yet, you know? It's, like, that kind of weird thing around award season where it's like, this movie was so great, says everyone who's seen it, and no one has seen it yet, so you're right. kind of like... It, we're very early to all of this stuff, but... Um, they had, like, a limited release to get qualified, and then they may exactly. come out, or... Uh, or or they're about to come out in the next week or so. Um, but uh, the zone of interest, Mika Chu, which is uh, Mika Levi, Mika mm-hmm. Levy. I'm not sure how to say the last name, but Levi, um, yeah, I think she's she's been doing things, and this is her band, uh, and that's very exciting. Uh, the boy and the heron, with uh, that's Joe Hisaishi, mm-hmm. Oppenheimer, Ludwig Göransson, yep. Poor Things, Jerskin Fendrix. Killers of the There's Flower a Moon name for us. Yep. Yeah, K- Killers of the Flower Moon, uh the late Robbie Robertson yep. and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, friend of the show Daniel Pemberton. Such a such a cool score in that too. Yeah, I mean all I haven't seen The Zone of Interest yet. Um Poor Things is yet to come out. Uh Killers of the Flower Moon I I have started on and it's a time commitment so I stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> in, uh <laughs> Freaking as is Scorsese, every three Scorsese hours, man. movie. Yeah, you got to put it on the calendar. No meetings. Uh, I'm watching a film here. <laughs> yeah, block this off, and yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's another uh, interesting year, and um, I mean, it is kind of cool to see some of the the different uh, approaches that are, are coming into this industry. Again. Yeah. Uh, I mean, today's episode, obviously, the interview uh, that we're doing with Richard Reed Perry is a great example of that because it's uh, a really different kind of a sound um, that's coming into this, this world again of of film music. And so um, it'll be interesting to chat with him a little bit about, I don't know how he bridges the gap from being um, kind of creating things with other musicians and that then becoming part of this whole visual experience. Uh, Arcade fire did work on the movie her. So there's a little bit of history there. Um, Yeah. But, but that uh, was more of like a band score versus a score right. score. And when you see the Iron Claw, you will see that he's not writing Queen songs for an arena wrestling match. This is a tragedy film, and there's a lot yep. of heartbreak and emotion in that film. And all those moments needed some superb music, and he did a great job in it. So, uh, Which yeah, we set we're gonna... this up as a wrestling movie, but it's also this movie yeah. about this this curse that is like a really uh it's accessible to anybody who's watching it so it's not like an inside you know i'm yeah. not a huge wrestling fan but this is a, a super cool concept to me so i think people would like this and the music is really cool yeah well uh let's get to it we're gonna jump in now with our interview with film composer and rock star richard reed perry 
we are super excited and thrilled to be joined by Grammy-winning recording artist, core member of Arcade Fire, and he's hot on the scene as a film composer with two films out this year, Eileen and The Iron Claw. Please welcome to the show Richard Reed Perry. Richard, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you guys doing? Great, great. Um, big time for you, man. I mean, The Iron Claw, uh, when, when this episode comes out, will be out. Uh, how exciting yeah. is that for you right now, uh, having a film out in the holiday season like that? It's real exciting. I mean, the the funny thing is I have two out kind of within three weeks of each other, which I don't know how long, I mean, I don't know how often that happens for film composers, but it seems like it can't happen that often. But um, but yeah, I mean, Eileen, I, I actually scored last year and it kind of it premiered at Sundance and then I think it took them a while to to figure out their distribution scenario and so it has it just ended up that they both came out in the same month um but iron claw was kind of like uh a scramble until like a couple months ago they kept they kept changing the picture up until the last minute so we kind of they kind of came out of picture lock twice and wow. um, i was still messing around with really minutia and micro details like in late october i think <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that can you be know. frustrating i'm sure especially coming from the artist world where you're you're more in control of everything, right? Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, it's a it's an adjustment that I'm that I'm making and getting used to uh, and figuring out the dance of you know how that how it works because I'm definitely coming. You know, I kind of I'm coming in through a side entrance into into film scoring um, where you know I come from the world of making albums for album's sake, uh, and I still kind of relate to it that way. I'm kind of taking on projects based on oh, does this seem like an album that I want to make? And if it seems like an album that I want to make and the movie, you know, it seems this is a, does it seem like a good movie, but B, does it seem like an album that I can really get into making? And if so, yes. Okay. That's, that's a, that's a go ahead for me. What is the kind of, uh, courting process like with a filmmaker, as opposed to some other musician who you can kind of maybe, you know, collaborate more directly on an art form with, but in this case, you're inviting in this kind of visual component, and this own yeah. kind of creative mind that works mostly in another field and the end result has to be something magical. What's that, uh, what, what are you noticing about trying to, you know, find that, uh, that perfect sweet spot with uh, a new type of creative mind? Yeah. I mean, what I've noticed so far, and you know, I'm sort of, I'm four films into my scoring career, three of which are, well, Iron Claw is about to be out, so that'll be three. And I, I just scored um, a documentary that actually my, uh, my wife co-wrote um, and co-created, and that'll be out sometime oh, next awesome. year. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's interesting because di directors, like the first thing I notice is that directors, my theory so far is that directors all sort of wish they were composer musicians mm -hmm. and it's like because they're just they're just so used to being able to be you know in charge of slash the the genesis and the nucleus of every element yeah. of their art form but music generally you know that obviously there's there's exceptions to the rule but generally speaking music thus far my experience is is that directors the directors i've worked with are kind of like music is this is still this kind of final frontier. It's still kind of magical and uh, and mysterious, and like they don't really understand how it works, and they also maybe really don't don't really have a proper vocabulary for it, and they kind of know that, and they don't <laughs> they don't quite know how to how to bridge that, you know. Um, and so, but but I think there's something really fertile and cool there, where it's like my experience is also that they get really excited and almost like there's like a childlike kind of wonder that <laughs> that directors still have for music even though you know like relatively speaking we as musicians and composers take such a shorter amount of time to make music than especially if the director is also the writer of a film or like Sh sean who wrote and directed the iron claw also wrote and directed the nest which is his previous one that i worked on it's like both of those he wrote and directed and so that's like a five to seven year project for him where yeah. he kind of takes his time writing and then he takes his time envisioning and storyboarding and then he takes his time making it as much as he can. But, and then, you know, then there's a crazy rush, but it's like, I just can't even, I can't personally fathom working on something actively for that long. Like music, there's just such a 
more immediate payoff. And we're in film, it's all, you know, you're writing a film and then you're directing a film and it's all kind of projecting forward of like, this will probably be amazing. This will probably be cool. And this will probably work. And this will probably need to be better than it currently is or whatever, where it's music. It's like, if it's not good when you make it, it's not good. Then you make something else and you, or you change it. Or, you know what I mean? It's just so much more tactile where film, it's like you can storyboard all you want, but there's this power of imagination that they have to have that's, that's thinking forward that, that, you know, probably lots of really good composers have. I don't, I don't really have that. I have to, I have to hear a thing in front of me, you know, in my ears to know if it's good and has a, has a vibe and has a feeling to it. Um, I, you know, I can, I can write like, I can write a melody and I can write a chord progression that goes somewhere and I can think, oh yeah, when this is, if this is played by a string orchestra, this will sound great. Or, oh, this would sound awesome if it was French horn. I can think far ahead like that, but, but then beyond that, it's like, yeah, but will it have any mojo? Like, where does the vibe come from in a thing? Once you're, you know, once you, once you have whatever you have a strong melody or a strong little fragment of passage of music written and you're like yeah that's that's a good melody you know that's going to translate well to many you know it can translate to many instruments can translate to many arrangements or many right you know many different things you can do with it but like but where does the feel where does the feeling really come from and how do you know that it's going to have that feeling when you know and and i i prefer to just like be be kind of trying to connect to the feeling mm. right away and trying to record it right away. It's like, if that's going to be French horn, then let's record it on a French horn right now. And I'm going to call my guy and we're going to do that. Yep. That's the thing. Okay, great. Now we're in business. Like <laughs> it already has a feeling, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of digressing, but all that to say, like it, it's a marvel to me how director's brains works, how a director's brain works and how, you know, you can, you then have to you, you step step into this dance with with someone who's thinking forward theoretically um, in a way that I, I find kind of astounding. Well, how does your timeline differ? Like, if you're working on an Arcade Fire album versus something like this, like, does we hear horror stories about deadlines with with film composers? But is this something that is daunting to you, or do you do you thrive in that sort of deadline, that short period of time? It's daunting and it's, it's definitely like, it's more stressful than my experience of, of being in a band has been, but I've also been extremely lucky in terms of my band experience where Arcade Fire has been basically an independent band functioning on its own terms for its whole career. Um, but at this really, you know, this kind of surprising level of popularity for an independent band. So we've been like, just really gotten away with so much in terms of no one's no one's breathing down our necks for for the next record and no one's there messing with our album or our, our idea of what it's going to be you know like it's um it's really we're really lucky in terms of what the what the traditional model of record making has been compared to a lot of people um so comparative to that it's a lot more stressful making a film <laughs> score but it's what i really like about it because it's also, you know, I have all kinds of solo musical endeavors outside of Arcade Fire as well. And those are a lot harder to rein in in terms of having a deadline or a frame around like what, you know, what's the framework around how this will be released or when it has to be done for and then what happens to it once it's done and what do you do? And you can only tour so many things, so many projects so much of the time. And, and so I, what I've been really loving about film composing is it's like you're signing up to a framework that's totally established and like the date is there when you say yes i'll do this film it's like you know when it has to be done and you're like okay this is how much time i have to make music and then it'll be done and then i don't have to think about what i'm going to do afterwards <laughs> i don't have to be like how do i launch this record like what's the right. <laughs> what's the name of the project what like who who's going to promote it who's going to put it out it's like you don't think about any of that stuff you actually just have to your job is done when it's done you know um, and I, I love that. So the kind of, you know, the stress of the infinite back and forths and the, and the, the deadlines when some, some part of, you know, some essential piece of the film musically isn't working yet and you haven't nailed it and the deadline is looming. That's, that can be a little bit of a panic, but so far it's been totally fine. Um, 
and yeah, as I say, it's kind of a trade off for like a nice tidy framework around what the what the music is and where it will live. What was your timeline for the Iron Claw? What how much time did you have? Did you um maybe take us back? What was kind of your introduction to this? I know you had probably a little bit of a shorthand already with the director who you'd worked with on on the the film prior. Was that your first film score? The Nest was my first uh, on my own. I mean, mm-hmm. Ar- Arcade Fire did um, her, the Spike Jones right. film, yep. um, but that was, you know, that was, I mean, that was really making a band album combined with making a film score. It was like had the limitations and the framework of making a film score, and there was kind of this tight crunch, time crunch, while we were also trying to make uh, our album Reflector at the same time. Um, so it was kind of stressful in, in that way. Um, but then also it's, 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 you know, it's contained and it's clear and it's like, oh, this bit isn't working of the, of the film. We have to fix that. What'll it be? This is what it'll be. Okay. It's done. Whereas like making a record, it kind of sprawls out and you're like, oh, this bit of the record isn't really working. What do we do? I don't know. Like it, there's no scene telling you yeah. like <laughs> right. this thing does not work and this thing will work. Therefore, you, you know, you take option B. Um, anyway, as to your question, the timeline it's a little vague when it started. Um, like Sean sent me this script before they started shooting or anything like that. Um, he, he, I mean, he asked me to do it when we were working on the nest, when we were okay. in mid, mid, mid process on that film. Um, cause we both were really enjoying working together. Uh, and it was a really nice process. I was, that was a wonderful introduction, um, to my first solo experience being a composer for film. Um, well, that was his directorial debut too, wasn't it? No, his, his first, like his kind of breakout film was called Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene. That's um, right. Okay. That was like that won bajillions of awards and was, it was Elizabeth Olsen's kind of breakout film. Um, and, but that was some, some years ago now. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he kind of, he found me, um, via a, a solo record that I wrote called music for heart and breath that he really loved. And he wrote the nest, listening to that album on loop mm. apparently. And then he just reached out and was like, can you score the nest? Which I was happy to do. Um, and I did. And that was, yeah, it was a really fun process and we were both really happy about it. So anyway, all that to say that the kind of the wheels were in motion while we were still working on that. He was like, my next film is about wrestling. Are you in? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, totally. Are, were you a wrestling um, fan or what, what drew you to, yeah. b- despite yeah, your relationship with him, what, what made you want to jump on board? As a young teenager, I I did I grew up without a TV, and and so wrestling was like the thing that all the young kids around me were into and watched, and I didn't have any access to because I had no TV. Uh, and then my my fa- family finally got a TV when I was like in grade eight, I guess. And then I kind of started making up for lost time, so it was like watching <laughs> Looney Tunes and watching WWF on Saturday. Yeah, <laughs> so it was like. <laughs> so so insane looking back you're like wow but um but yeah but it, all that to say it was resonant it was like i had definitely i went down a, a rabbit hole with wrestling for a couple of years as like a probably 12 13 year old which is a little little later than kids usually get into it but there we are um uh anyway yeah he he invited me into that project well in advance of it even existing and then kind of sent me the script when it was done and and as he as filming started to approach, I for, at, at some point he was like, he sent me the playlist of songs that he'd been listening to while he was writing the film, which is all these kind of seventies kind of dude power rock songs, kind of Tom Petty and blue oyster cult and rush and, um, George Harrison, just, just like the kind of, yeah, kind of, folky rock and then kind of power power rock and springsteen and you know it's kind of hand in the air fist in the air ballady i can do it kind of songs <laughs> kind of like early early days machismo rock and roll like predating the kind of metal met <laughs> like over the top 80s sure. metal thing or hard rock thing but um but with this kind of fighting spirit to it and um and he was like, well, here's a playlist I've been writing to. And for the score, he's like, I don't know. I don't know what, exactly what the score needs to be, but I'm thinking big drums. And that was it. It was kind of like, that was the directive. And <laughs> again, like, are you, are you in? <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah so I'm still in. That, that sounds fun. It's extremely open to interpretation and extremely open-ended. And, 
Um, and then I just started thinking, okay, he wants like power rock and like seventies big drums. I just started recording. Like I would just go to my studio and kind of jam out and play guitar and play drums and play bass and just bang out kind of instrumental rock tunes that kind of had had kind of a 70s easy slant to them um and we just my my process thus far as, as a composer on every film is like make lots of ideas early on just make tons and tons of ideas and don't censor anything you know once you've either read this read the script or seen a scene or whatever they've got um to look at just look at that and just get a vibe and then don't don't get too caught up in thinking about what's what, but just make lots of music intuitively in the dark and, and bombard the director with ideas and let them sift and see if anything resonates. And if anything resonates great and you go from there and then you make more and you, you kind of do that for a while um, until you start to establish some kind of core feeling or, you know, thematic ideas start to emerge. Um, anyway, so I started doing that with these kind of like power rock ideas and, and at some point during that process, I was like, also, what if having, you know, having read the script, I was like, what if there's a song, like, what if there's a song in the film and like, it could be kind of running in the, one of the characters heads, you know, it's all these young lads, these wrestlers. And, and then turns out one of them is in a band. And I was like, yeah, right. What if, what if there's like a song that's connected to one of them that he's kind of singing to himself and there's some kind of interior monologue there or, or like a, in lieu of a, an interior monologue. Um, and Sean was like, yeah, that could work. That's an idea. And, and, um, and anyway, and, and, and I, it's, and I asked my, my wife, Laurel, um, Hey, I think we, we'd been, we'd years earlier, we, we were kind of writing songs together um, in a way, in a, in a, in a fashion that kind of connected to this kind of 70s kind of, and kind of like power rock, but just the two of us, like this kind of duo, mm -hmm. we were banging around all these ideas and it never materialized into an actual project, but, but we had this real flavor of stuff that we were doing. And I was like, we should just do something. We should just write a, a tune for this. And, and, uh, threw something at her and we threw a couple of things around and wrote this, this song. And I, and I immediately, as soon as we started writing it, I was like, okay, Sean, I think I have a song for the film and I think it belongs in the film. And in fact, I didn't really know that it belongs in the film and here it is. And it's a song that's called live that way forever. Um, that's a, in, in the credits of the film, but it's also played by the youngest brother in the film. He's kind of, he's got a band and he plays, he plays, he's kind of rehearsing this song in his garage that's with awesome, his bandmates. Yeah. And then he plays it at a house party and, um, Anyway, so that, and and that, and as soon as I sent it to him, we just demoed it right away. I kind of we kind of recorded it in a, in an afternoon. I played all the parts, and Laurel sang it. And I was like, I think this song belongs in the film. You know, having not, there's no film to see yet. Right. But I was like, I just feel like the spirit of this song, like this song, could sit beside any of those any of those songs on on the playlist he was talking about. You know, all these like Tom Petty songs yeah. and Springsteen and Rush and all these things. It was like I, I, this just could sit anywhere with those songs and if you heard it you could think oh i've never heard that song like wh what is that and you feel like it's kind of from that era you know but it, um anyway he immediately was like oh my god this is a really good song i'm totally in love with this nice. thank you we're like we've got to write the film around this we got to rewrite we got to like write a scene around this and so he kind of was like okay that Youngest brother was there any anxiety at all by how he would react, or did you know it was good? <laughs> I knew it was really good, yeah. and I, I, there was a bit of like, I really think this belongs, and I yeah. hope that he, I hope that he really. I, anyway, I just hoped that it hoped that it land would land because also he, I'd been bo kind of bombarding him with all these rock ideas, and right, yeah, he hadn't like none of them had like lit up yet in the way that I had been used to like getting really clear. This is a yes. Oh my God, let's do this from the, from the, from the nest. Um, where pretty early on in the process, I started making ideas as well. And, and from the get go, he was like, Ooh, this one, this has got something really interesting. And oh, they, oh this one also has something really interesting. Anyways, it was, it was faster to, to kind of gel. And, and this was also a harder film by a mile yeah. to score in the end, which once I saw the first cut of the film, um, I was like, 
I was really daunted when I saw the film. I was like, this is an insane beast of a movie emotionally. Like that. I don't even know if I can do this. I don't know what this emotional tone is when I, when I finally saw it, but having fed them this song and him, re, you know, writing it into the film. And so then he wrote it into the film, which meant I had to teach the, these actors how to play the song cause, <laughs> so they, they could do it live because it's them actually playing it in the house. You know, it's recorded like diegetically. Yeah. It's an on, on scene piece of music, um, so which I did. I kind of <laughs> recorded videos of me playing each part of the song, kind of YouTube video site, like, hey, guys, here's a baseline <laughs> for Live That Way Forever, um, which is super fun. And, and I kind of hung out uh, over Zoom with with Stanley, the, the actor who, who plays the the young brother um and walked him through it in a bunch of ways and he kind of asked me questions about it and we just had a nice a nice thing anyway that was kind of like weirdly that was kind of like the beginning of the score because that was that was like the first idea that that landed oh wow um and so i was like okay well i'm standing on something i'm not standing on nothing here um well you you mentioned yeah you mentioned that it's it it's impactful and super emotional and i i actually uh shot on the red carpet i still have my uh my claw here oh um, yeah i was at, i was there in dallas i don't were you at the the premiere sadly i wasn't at the oh. dallas premiere I, was, I went to the la premiere um but well, I, I i was tied up for the dallas one i i saw the movie and you know i grew up watching wrestling I, i'm a wrestling fan and it was it, it's kind of like one of those movies where you think you're going to see a boxing movie but it's not match after match after match it's really there's a little yeah. bit of boxing in it, but it's really about a family and a bunch of yeah. tr- tragic events that happen to this family and them kind of sticking yeah. together. And it's, it is really impactful and, and emotional. And that's, I think, you know, and then going in and listening to your score, we got a chance to take a, a listen to it. It hasn't come out yet, but all of these cues are so heavy. It's not what you'd expect. You're talking about writing yeah. rock music, but there's a lot of these really heavy cues did that as you're writing all these cues for thinking like maybe stadium anthem rock type stuff and then you see some of these scenes like how did how did it change for you as you started seeing picture well i mean none of that stuck like one one of those tunes i wrote like like a couple dozen kind of rock banger instrumentals and that you know very varying degrees of intensity and uh thinking this is where we're going. And then it was like, yeah, none, one of those stuck. That's kind of like the first, the first wrestling match that you see in the film, um, is like, is one of those early, early pieces in the process. Um, but the rest of it just fell by the wayside. That's like in the, in the idea has been for something else later at this point. Um, and it was, and as I said, like the first time that I saw a cut of the film, I was like, Whoa, I do not know how to score this like i <laughs> truly don't know what this needs and and by that point he had kind of sean had kind of moved past the big drums uh idea and was like it was like we need like this whole film is about a curse it's about the family curse that these guys believe in right and they were kind of tagged this the von eric family was tagged with the von eric curse it's like all these all these sons who horrible things keep happening to and um and so he's like we need a curse theme like that's the central thing we need a curse theme and so it's like it needs to be kind of like claustrophobic and eerie and dangerous but not too on the no anything not too anything on the nose it's like something is lurking around all the time like there's a evil completely <laughs> I don't think different you ever use the word from arcade but... fire by the way <laughs> yeah oh yeah Com- <laughs> like... i mean completely different from anything and also completely different from like a playlist of classic rock you know like just sure. like okay we're so we're pivoting from big drums and classic rock to something nebulous and evil and that sounds kind of old kind yeah. of period they left the, it, the classic rock to the needle drops it seems like and then they relied on you to really carry those heart yeah mostly mm-hmm. yeah there's there's some there's like some of the rock stuff that i wrote early on as i said ended up we you know there's kind of one piece that we ended up using a few different times like or in a, in a few different ways um that but really the whole thing turned to, into no we need something that's like nebulous and haunting and kind of 
you know, for me, it was like, okay, there needs to be something. If, if we're talking about a curse theme, it also needs to, it needs to be like laced with something kind of m- mighty or something because it's all about this, you know, raw physical prowess of these, of these dudes. They're all turning themselves into these muscly, you know, muscly wrestlers and, and it's all in the arena. And even though the film is about family and, and about masculinity and all this other stuff, it's not actually like about wrestling. Um, that's there, right? We're like yeah. hanging out with all these extremely strong and agile bodies and this, these wild displays of, of prowess and endurance and strength and acrobatics and all of it. Um, and so there, I was kind of like, okay, like big horns or sorry, big, big drums still in the back of my head, but like claustrophobic and creeping and curse like, like, okay, let's go French horns and, and like, big orchestral drums maybe and and um so kind of started there started recording a bunch with um pietro who produced the whole score and who's kind of my my musical other half really um and we started just working on lots of stuff him playing lots of french horn i would write stuff and and get him to record layers of french horn um and still kind of recording drums and drum kit but kind of transformed it into a more nebulous sounding thing that doesn't really sound like drum kit. It's more, <laughs> a little bit more orchestral and kind of classic sounding, but it is actually just drum kit. Um, and kind of went from there and start ideas started to land. And we started to have these kind of sort of big and epic, but dark and foreboding kind of thematic material started to come out of that. Um, and then I'm a, I'm an upright bassist. And so it, started to just use, lean on upright bass a lot. And so it kind of became upright bass and French horn and drums. And then everything from there was kind of extraneous, but that's really the core of the whole score. Um, so very, very dark and, and kind of thick. But then there's there's the contrast, which I didn't realize this until I checked out the score, but you wrote the like 80s TV Set, like 70s and 80s TV <laughs> intro themes, which are super funny. And like knowing that you wrote those is crazy because they're so legit sounding. Oh, uh, thank I, you. <laughs> I'm cracking up that you got to write those. Did you have to like, you said you didn't even watch TV until eighth grade, really. So what? Yeah. What? <laughs> how I mean, did you, yeah, that ins- was... what inspired those? Did you watch old wrestling clips or something? Well, yeah, they, I mean, I think they weren't, I don't think they were allowed to, they would have used the actual like WCW themes, you know, bits that they, that they, they had in there from, from, um, kind of archival footage. Um, originally that was like the, the placeholder was like real archival, you know, in commercial moments. Um, but th- that they weren't allowed to use the, the OG stuff for whatever reason. And so they're, they're like, can you, you know, can you do something to replace this? And we did we did the first thing we did there was like, it was really imitative, um, but in a, in a really fun way, it was like, Oh yeah, I can, you know, replicate that. And it was <laughs> a little, we flew a little too close to the sun and they were like, yeah, legal, legal department says this won't fly. <laughs> can you, can you do this again? <laughs> um, and so we just transformed that. Um, and there was honestly those, both of those little pieces were like the most fun of the entire soundtrack. It was like really fast, really easy because you're kind of like working within a framework of like oh yeah this has to sound like kind of chintzy 70s like interstitial you know saturday night main event music and like the strings can be kind of midi sounding like already because they were already starting to get into that late 70s um yeah and kind of like cheesy but beautiful harmonized guitars and things like this anyway um that was really really fun i was like uh i'm pretty good at imitating stuff um and so it was a really fun thing to be trying to imitate stuff just enough that it sounded legit but also trying to make it you know trying to make bangers that came up, <laughs> came across like legit <laughs> wrestling promo music oh it's so funny i i just i could believe that when i played i'm like he wrote those that's awesome <laughs> um when you transition into film scoring it you know it seemed like a happy accident and now here we are you're in this world but we've seen a ton of you know, band guys, artists come from that world and jump into this world. Did you reach out to anyone who's done this transition or did you lean on anyone for tips on just the process? Cause it's at the end of the day, you're writing music, but this process going through it is completely different and there's a lot of layers to it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I didn't really, to be honest, like I felt like I had learned 
I had learned enough just from when Arcade Fire scored her. I kind of, you know, that was that was working on a a medium budget feature film um, with a bunch of other people. So you kind of had this cushion of like, you're still acting like a band. You don't have to be like an individual representing yourself to a, to a mysterious bunch of producers, whatever it was like. And Spike was a friend of ours. So it was kind of, it was kind of a nice intro to the whole thing where it was like, he definitely knew, he definitely knew he wanted us to be doing our thing for the movie. But then he also, you know, had kind of done the thing that lots of directors do of, of filling the music up with temp music. And there was all sorts of things that didn't really sound like arcade fire. So then it was like this negotiation match of like, how do you, you know, how do you respond to and ultimately replace temp music, which is a whole, I'm sure like books could be written on the subject. Um, but yeah, it kind of felt like the the process was not very mysterious to me. And so when Sean asked me to do the nest, I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. Like, I got some time and um, I like to make music. <laughs> and it, and it was and it, that was also a really small ensemble, I guess. Like when I did the nest, it was it was myself and uh, my friend Parker Spur, who's a really amazing pianist. Um, and a woman named Ayumi Paul, who's also a dear friend, who's an incredible violinist. And my friend Stuart Bogey, who's a, a wind player from New York, also a dear friend. Um, and that was it. It was like, that was the, the ensemble. So it was really small and the scope of how much space he wanted the music to take up in the film was also quite intimate and small and stripped back. And so it, although it was, you know, it, it like, it plays a, a very specific role, but it's like very minimal in a lot of ways. Um, and so the combination of those two films being my first two entrances into film scoring, it, like it, it didn't feel very mysterious after that. And it's like, obviously working on a massive budget Hollywood, you know, thriller or action movie or something would be a whole different process. Um, and I haven't got there yet. <laughs> we'll see what the future holds. I don't know if that's where I would want to go. Um, yeah. Where do you position but, yourself now? Are you a, a band member who scores films here and there? Or are you a film composer now? Like, what do you, what do you call yourself if someone asks? I mean, I've, I like, I've always thought of myself as just kind of like a, a musically free spirit composer, musician, um, and arcade fire getting as famous as it did as quickly as it did was not like in, in my life plan. And, and so when it did, and all of a sudden it was the only thing that I had time for and was doing 24 seven and was all over the world with, it was like really awesome experience in so many ways. But I was also like, Whoa, I got like, I need some balance over here. And so, you know, it took some time to figure out how to get that balance and how to go and make my own, you know, my own compositional albums and keep, I have an ensemble called Bell Orchestra that I still play with and we still make records and uh, making, I mean, I make all kinds of solo records um, and like, and I still really enjoy doing all of those things. And I feel like, and I'm a real collaborator at heart and I still need to do that all the time. Um, so I really just think of myself in the same way as this kind of broad spectrum <laughs> musical <laughs> free spirit, um, who kind of plays many different instruments and writes many different kinds of music. And, um, I'm a adept in many different kinds of musical situations and totally not adept in many other kinds of musical situations, you know? Um, so yeah, I, it, it's kind of like, um, I just do my thing. <laughs> I don't, the future is unsure. <laughs> yeah. The future is always unsure, but it is always creatively driven. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I get excited. I like to just do work that I'm excited about, um, whatever I'm doing. And I'm very blessed to be able to just do that, you know, and I get to uh, like the same way that being in a band, only being in a band was never my goal and only doing that for the rest of time was never my goal. I feel the same way about film scoring. Where I'm like, I, I love this. I take this really seriously. It's also something I aspired to do from quite a young age and it just sort of came to it slightly later um, and indirectly in a roundabout kind of way. But, um, but also I couldn't just make music on demand on a deadline full time, 365 days a year, you know, um, yeah. I need to also have a wander and go make experimental chamber music records and play on my friends' folk albums and 
just expand. I'm a, I'm a naturally expansive musical creature. Do you know, uh, are you at the, that early stage of, you know, I want big drum sound and uh, all of that. Do you know what the next project is with Sean or someone else? Are you currently being haunted by any parameters like that for the next project? No, right now um, I'm actually like, I'm just sort of coming to the end of an excruciatingly busy period and I am clearing my sca- I've got projects that have to be finished a couple of different records um but i am taking a break for a minute before having another deadline <laughs> that's a good idea yeah because uh, yeah. the, yeah. the sound of this i think um is gonna there's gonna be a lot a lot of interest if you're not hearing from people now i'm sure you you will be of people saying man that was really cool because it's a cool approach yeah yeah it's a cool i i mean i i feel i feel like i'm the approach that I'm taking, I feel like is like weirdly novel at, at this, yeah. at, at this junction at, like where and Eileen and Iron Claw both, where it's like, it's very like sort of live ensemble music and kind of, you know, it's like more related to like, you know, to like a taxi driver or a score like that. Yeah, for sure. Like a kind of a period, a period thing, but without really, it's not like, I'm not trying to ape, period recordings in the 60s or 70s but there's there's something in in those eras of film scoring that i relate to more than a lot of the modern stuff that i that i hear um that i'm definitely trying to channel a little bit you know try and just kind of t- use that sensibility a bit and and really invite in and you know invite in all the talents of my musical friends and and collaborators where it's like it's like it, scores only benefit from from more like more musical intelligences added in you know like music music only benefits from more musical intelligence being added in and the, the idea of just like being a you know lonesome string com- or lo- like lonesome composer alone in a room writing like midi strings all day and then like for <laughs> for 48 hours at the very end of a six-month process you get to actually make music with people it's like just doesn't appeal to me at all i'm like no i want to be in my studio or somewhere else that is interesting and fun. I want to be with other musicians and I want to like, I'm um, happy being kind of an ensemble leader that's roping in all sorts of people's talents. But it's, uh, to me, musical music is always, is always like primarily a communal activity outside of the, the, you know, whatever, whatever time you spend alone, I spend alone writing music and developing ideas. I want to counter that with, exploring that with people in a room and having real musical interactivity and and you know that's where mojo comes from it's like you gotta just get in a room and get get music to a place where it's got a vibe it's it can't just be all all uh alone alone act (laughs) (laughs) well it doesn't hurt too that the films that you scored this year are both like certified fresh and they're getting great reviews they're they're real i've seen both of them they're terrific um the Iron Claw, again, as a wrestling fan, I've been telling people, like, it's not a bunch of wrestling matches. It's a real yeah. story. It's it's heavy. There's a lot of heart. There's a good message. And um, it's just, it's really well done. So I, I would yeah, say... Yeah, I mean, it's excellent cinema, you know? It's, yeah, it's not what I expected, but not in a yeah. bad way. It was it was yeah. great. Um, and yeah, and the transformation, any- some of those guys, like, Zac Efron is jacked in that movie. I couldn't believe that, man. Yeah, he he did yeah, some absolutely. like crazy dieting or something. I don't know. Got to figure that they all, out. I mean, they all trained. They all just trained like crazy with real like with wrestling trainers. Who, yeah, that's what they do. You know. Yeah, it's the the it's really cinema in a way that you you know every movie that you go to, you're not like that's cinema. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? <laughs> but it's yeah. like both both Iron Claw and Eileen, both of them, it's like, oh yeah, this is like capital C cinema. Like you leave the, totally. mm-hmm. you leave the theater kind of shaken up and with a lot of questions and a lot of different feel like conflicting pile of feelings that needs sorting out. And it's, I, I found both of those movies really inspiring to, to work on and, and both really challenging in, in different ways. Well, as Matt mentioned, your door is going to be knocking. Um, we're really happy to have you on the show. Congratulations on, these two films and as a big fan of your stuff with arcade fire, hopefully more is to come. Yeah. And uh, more. Yeah. yeah, really. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And a reminder to our listeners, we just a uh, quick little business here. Uh, you can follow us, score the podcast on X 
uh, score movie on Instagram, score a film music documentary on Facebook, and uh, you can watch these episodes on YouTube for free. Uh, just search score a film music documentary or score the podcast and you can find that. Richard Reed Perry, thanks so much, man, for this coming awesome. on the show. We really appreciate it. Congratulations. No, it's a pleasure. Yeah, nice to meet both you and, and thank you guys. That was really fun. All right. Happy holidays to you, brother. You too.